Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 37th and final meeting of 2017. There are no apologies. Agenda item number one is a decision on whether to consider a draft stage one report on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland bill and a draft report on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19 in private at future meetings and to consider our work programme in private at today's meeting. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Thank you. Um, agenda item number two is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. The focus of the committee's scrutiny this year is on the budget for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And I welcome to the meeting the Right Honourable James Wolfe QC, Lord Advocate, and David Harvey, Crown Agent and Chief Executive of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. Lord Advocate, do you wish to make a short opening statement? Um, if I may, Convener, um, and can, can I first of all thank you very much for inviting me to give evidence. I'm very glad to uh, assist the committee with its scrutiny of the budget. Um, perhaps I can make a few observations simply to set the discussion in its uh, context. And I think the first thing that I should say is that in the past year, the service has continued to prosecute crime effectively, fairly, independently, and in the public interest. Day in and day out, throughout the past year, you will have read in the press accounts of cases which the service has brought successfully to a conclusion. And the cases that are reported in the press are, of course, only a fraction of the work of the service. That is a tribute to the professionalism and commitment of the prosecutors who prosecute on my behalf across Scotland and all the staff who support them. And I'm glad, convener, once again to have the opportunity uh, publicly to underline my confidence in them. Uh, they deserve great credit for the service they provide to the public interest in the administration of justice uh, in Scotland. Uh, the real-term increase in the services budget this year will allow the service to respond to the release of the cap on public sector pay, to do so from April, and at the same time to choose to maintain its staffing at or about current levels. And the committee will recognise that this budget allocation represents a significant departure from the previous planning assumptions that the service had been working to, which uh, were for flat cash and a reduction uh, in staff levels. Um, notwithstanding the stability which this uh, budget allocation provides to the service, uh, I certainly don't underestimate the challenges which uh, face it. For example, while there has been a decline in the number of cases reported to the Crown generally, we are witnessing a marked increase in the number of reports of serious sexual offences, up some 50% compared with uh, last year. Uh, and it's clear that much remains to be done across the whole justice system to meet the expectations of victims of crime. The service is responding to the changing caseload. It's in discussion with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service about court programming. The expertise which now exists within the specialist High Court sexual offences units will enable the processes for those cases to be uh, streamlined. And I've tasked the Crown Agent with scoping out the implications of a strategic shift of further resources to deal with serious sexual cases and other complex cases with a view to informing future decision making. In its financial planning, the service has prioritised non-staff savings. The Crown Agent has made good on the commitment which he made to this committee to reduce markedly the number of staff on part-time contracts. This budget settlement gives us stability in relation to staff numbers. The service will continue to bear down on non-staff costs because it recognises rightly that its people are its greatest asset. And that belief also underpins the Fair Futures project, which should start to take effect in, uh, from April next year. Um, in conclusion, can I say this? Although this session is a budget scrutiny session, um, none of us should lose sight of the fundamental purpose of the system of prosecution of crime, which is to underpin a just and secure society. 
and I welcome the committee's continuing interest in the work of the service, which is a reflection of the importance which rightly attaches to it. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion uh, uh, which will ensue. Okay, thank you, uh, Lord Adwick, for that opening statement, uh, during which you pay tribute to the professionalism and, and commitment of the Crown and Pro, uh, Procurative Fiscal and allude to the fact that, that people are the, the service's greatest asset. The committee concurs with that, but still remains, I, I think, very concerned about reports of um, the workload and, more, uh, and low morale. So I wonder if you could comment specifically in your submission, um, Lord Advocate, on the staff sur survey results published in November, which confirm that on matters such as paying benefits, resources and work uh, and um, leadership of change, in fact, the, the general direction and future um, direction of the organisation, the, me the measure of positive outlook uh, fell from 57% to 55%. Yes. Um, it, I don't um, uh, deny that I was disappointed to see that on um, a, a number of measures the survey this year fell back from what was, I think, a very favourable, in historical terms, um, uh, uh, survey uh, last year. Um, and perhaps if I could make a particular point about, um, uh, convene, you made a point about the um, uh, figures for uh, workload and, uh, and the like, um, and it is perhaps important to see those in context. Um, in, in this survey, 57% of staff report that they have an acceptable workload, which is up 1% from last year. I, I don't make anything particular of that, but that it, it is up 16% from the equivalent figure in the 2015 survey, up 11% from the 2014 survey, up 13% from the 2013 survey. So although it's remained, to all intents and purposes, static compared with last year, um, the, the figure on acceptable workload is a significant, in, uh, be, ex significant improvement as compared with two years ago, or the previous um, uh, figures And on the work-life balance, 64% um, of staff report in this survey that they achieve a good work-life uh, balance. Um, now, that is down 3% from last year, but at the same time, it is up 9% from 2015, up 5% from 2014, up 8% from 2013. So, I don't for a moment seek to... Um, uh, to shy away from, 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 from disappointment um, in, the, uh, if, if, in this survey, but I think it is perhaps important to see it in a historical, uh, you know, in, in a context where mm -hmm. um, we saw a very significant improvement on these measures last year. Um, we've fallen back a, a bit on the work-life balance figure, but it's still uh, better than it has been um, if, in the past. Could, now, now, yeah. now, can I kind of very yes, clearly convene? I don't for a moment um, uh, you know, uh, uh, shy away from the, um, the, 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 the the challenging nature of the work that um, is demanded of, 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 of public prosecutors or from the evidence that the uh, committee has um, uh, reporting individual experience. But I think it is perhaps important to look at the data um, and see it in a, you know, in, in, a, in, in a context and to see a service which is um, improving, not just in those figures, but we also see the sickness rate is significantly down, 8.7 days per person, down from 10.1 days in October 2016. Um, we've got the Fair Futures Project project which is ongoing and which will start to take effect from April of next year. The Crown Agent's made good on his commitment to reduce the number of staff on temporary contracts. Um, the service that, that, that has, with respect, been covered in your opening statement, Lord Advocate, but I'm really <laughs> trying to establish 43% do not um, believe they've got an acceptable workload. That's almost half of the workforce. 36% are saying that they don't have a good work-life balance. So I, I'm hoping from this evidence session we're getting some specifics about how uh, and what is being done to address these concerns 
why it's happening. You've mentioned the, the increase in sexual, um, uh, sexual offences in the High Court. That's been covered. But what specifically yes. is being done to address these two really important issues, given you've already said the workforce is all important yes. for the efficient running of the Crown and Procurator uh, Fiscal uh, Service? I absolutely take that point, convener. I think it's, it, it is important to... Um, put those uh, figures in the context of the civil service norm. Now, plainly, uh, I would like to see the service do as well as or, or better than the civil service norm. It, it is, the, on, on these two measures, four percentage points below the civil service norm. So, while below the civil service norm, not wildly out of, of step. Now, I, I would like to see it uh, these figures uh, in a better place. Um, could it, you could it, perhaps give some specifics of what's been done to do it? I mean, we, we could yes. quote figures at each other oh, all course. morning, but yes. um, specifics well, would be good. Well, well, perhaps it's important to... Um, uh, to, 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 uh, perhaps it would be worth asking the Crown Agent to remind the committee about the uh, Fair Futures project, which he's leading forward and which is specifically designed to seek to address, um, uh, in, in a broad sense, the well-being of staff. I think um, if, if I may um, start off with, with um, one thing about the, the changing profile of the work, um, uh, which may assist in, in, in a, a, a setting a, a, a landscape to, to, to answer the question beyond um, a, a simply then a, the Fair Futures work. The, the first thing is that, that uh, throughout the course of the last year, the number of outstanding trials in both the JP Court and the Sheriff Court have dropped dramatically. Um, and so the, the number of JP trials outstanding, for example, I think is down to 4,500 from 7,500. Um, in general, and there are exceptions and there are localities, and I'll come on to that, where this is not the case, um, it, it stands to reason that preparation um, is, is easier if the court is smaller. In other words, there are fewer trials in the court. And so it's, it's very, very welcome that over the course of the last year, the number of outstanding trials has generally gone down, including in the Sheriff Court. Um, but there are exceptions to that, and I think that that's part of the point in relation to um, what we see in the survey, is that there are, without doubt, um, uh, locations where um, uh, there are difficulties in relation to preparation of trials, there are difficulties in relation to advance notice trials, and I, I was conscious that that was something that was mentioned um, in the FDA submission. Um, there are large parts of the country where those um, difficulties do not arise, but that does not mean to say that there aren't these locations where they do and that those need to be addressed. And I think that that's reflected in the nuance of the staff survey, because what, what we have noticed um, this year in particular, in contrast and perhaps to, to previous years, is that there are quite significant differences in responses between localities, even within sheriffdoms. Um, so, um, uh, in Grampians, Highlands and Islands, for example, um, the survey results on, on one half of that sheriffdom went up 7% and the other half went down 7%. And again, that's to do with um, loadings and, and preparation times, etc., etc. So, it's, it's, a, it's a more complex picture than simply the national picture, and I suppose I'm saying that in the context to try and explain some of the more targeted work that we'll be doing as well. And so, first of all, the response in relation to the staff survey is that, that each of the sheriff and procurators fiscal has not only their own results, but also a, an appreciation of, of, of the wider results and why it is that they are perhaps um, a, in a different position so that they can look at local solutions. You'll recall that that was a significant aspect um, in, in the evidence last year about the need to ensure that there were local responses to problems. And so that's something that's being encouraged this year in relation to that. And one of the things that, that I would say is that, for example, that prompts negotiations with local sheriff's principal in relation to the court loadings over which we have no final say, but which are actually quite dramatically different across the country. Um, so, for example, they are significantly higher in Glasgow than they are in, in other parts of the country. And so when you see individual responses from individual members, I have absolutely no doubt that that's how they feel. But I, I, th I would caution that they, those do not necessarily extrapolate to a national picture in, in each of the cases. And so again, then com coming to the, the Fair Futures work, um, part of that, and most significantly from my perspective, was in and around appropriate support for, for staff welfare. You'll have noticed that we're already doing quite 
significant work in relation to that and making progress. You'll recall that it was, on average, 10.3 days um, of sickness absence, and that that's now on a significant downward trend, where it's now, I think, about 8.7, 8.6. It's still above the average, but it's heading in the right direction and continues to head in the right direction and has been achieved in a relatively short period of time and over the last 18 months as a result of changes in relation to the occupational health support that is provided in relation to other changes in relation to uh, uh, support for, for staff. And I think that that's a, a very significant thing that we will continue to progress with. Um, one of the other um, issues which has impacted um, on, um, a, on, on the organisation and which we're seeking to address is, is, is um, development across roles. One of the tensions in specialisation, and I think, again, I think, I think this was touched upon in evidence, is that, that with specialisation, there is a perception of a lack of opportunity. And indeed, when we visited Hamilton recently, someone characterised it and it stuck with me as there was a sense of stuckness, was the phrase they used. And, and it was a wonderful characterisation of, of how some people feel in relation to opportunities. And so again, that's something that Fair Futures Project is looking at in order to ensure that there is staff development in a far more coherent and structured fashion than has been the case hitherto. Um, and similarly, I, I think we may touch on um, a, 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 a pay and grading, perhaps, in, in, in evidence. We, since 1996, the service has had the opportunity, as have all departments, um, to, to, you know, in a delegated fashion, to structure its pay and grading structure. Aside from tinkering around the edges, um, really in the 20 years since, unlike other departments, there hasn't really been any significant change. And it, you know, if someone from 1996 were to look at our pay and grading structure, they would find it would be something they would recognise. That's something that we are looking at within the constraints of affordability and in consultation with staff. And there is no defined outcome to that. That is very much an open question about what it would be that might work for COPFS as an organisation going forward. Forgive me for the length of the, the, the reply, but it, it's, uh, it's demonstrative of what we're trying to achieve across the breadth of issues. It's certainly encouraging that you're looking at local um, issues and, and trying to come out with local responses. John Finney. Morning, pal. Thanks for your evidence. And of course, concur with the Lord Advocate's view about the good work that's ongoing there. So maybe just to pick up on the issue that Mr. Harvey raised there about the autonomy that you do have to configure your staff. Um, um, the Lord Advocate, if I noted you correctly, you talked about maintaining the staff at, at or about our current levels. You'll be familiar with the submission from the Public and Commercial Service Union, and in particular, if I can read just for the purposes of the record, paragraph 7, which says, like most departments and agencies, COPFS has taken the approach of achieving savings by cutting staff. When posts are vacant, they are not always filled or filled with someone on a lower grade. Abolishing a post make, makes, is making it redundant whether it is currently filled or not, and posts should not be regraded without proper consultation and job, job evaluation exercises carried out. Now, job evaluation exercise is a significant piece of work. Um, um, issues around equal play are alluded to there. Can you see what has been done with that and, and the level of engagement there is with the unions? Because clearly this is a, a factor, Mr Harvey. Or, 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 do you yes, know uh, I mean, uh, uh, perhaps I can just give a high-level response. Uh, Mr Finney, let the Crown agent respond on the detail. Uh, it, 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 it is, it, it's certainly not the case that the service is um, um, making savings by cutting staff as opposed to non-staff savings. Um, it's taken a very deliberate uh, decision to seek to prioritise non-staff savings uh, where it can. Um, it has seen a reduction in um, overall staff levels of about uh, 20 over the past year. The current budget allocation will allow for uh, stability uh, in, 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 the, in the year to come. Um, it, it, uh, the, I think the committee's got some evidence about the state's uh, strategy. That's ongoing work. It's um, uh, uh, the savings as a result of the state strategy are currently running at, I think, uh, a little over £700,000 a year. And it's expected that with further decisions to be made in the future, that that can be uh, enhanced. There are savings to be made in relation to pathology and mortuary costs and, and, and other costs. And the firm priority is to make savings in non-staff uh, uh, costs uh, where the service uh, can. And um, uh, it is perhaps no worth noting that the service has been able to make uh, choices 
um, with a view to preserving and, and I mean, preserving the frontline um, uh, staff. Um, so the, le the number of legal staff in the service, uh, if one looks at the past um, 10 years, there are, only two, two, there are only two years in which the um, figure for the number of legal staff uh, was higher than it is at present. Um, Crown Agent can perhaps give some more detail on the, uh, uh, on the points that you've raised. Uh, if, if I may, um, I know that this has been mentioned before, um, but I, I first of all must emphasise it just in terms of the, the, the level of commitment in relation to the, the, the staff. It was a significant issue during the course of the inquiry, rightly so on the last occasion in relation to temporary employment and temporary promotion. Um, and um, so 177 um, um, have been offered and uh, accepted permanent contracts and 115 have been permanently promoted. In terms of the, the, the overall use of funds um, by COPFS between staffing and non-staffing, in, um, in 2010 it was 59 per cent of, of the budget was on staffing. I'm projecting next year it's going to be 72. I'm projecting that the year after it will be higher than that. We are absolutely showing that we are prioritising savings on non-staff over staffing, and the proportion of the budget that we spend on staffing is, is, is ever increasing. The, the, the increase that we've got in the, in the budget this year will enable us to, to meet the public sector um, a, a pay policy and also to bring it forward to the start of April um, whilst maintaining staff numbers. That's not something that we anticipated that we would be able to do when we were discussing the plans on the previous occasion, where we anticipated that we would have to drop in numbers. I did say, though, if, if the committee recalls on the last occasion, that my expectation in light of the savings um, that, that we would have to make this year is that notwithstanding the fact that we, we spend about two-thirds presently of, of our budget on uh, uh, staffing, that we would still need to save about half so it's a disproportionate amount <coughs> on non-staff, we would still have to make staff savings. And that's why, as Lord Advocate has indicated, we are, we are smaller, as I said, we would be by about 20 staff this year. Um, and the, but what I'm projecting for next year in light of this settlement is that we will have stability and also increased pay and also increased permanence. But that's very reassuring on one level, Mr Harvey. However, um, that doesn't address the issues of unfilled posts or posts being filled by someone of a, of a, a reduced grade. Um, is, is there any plans to have some sort of workload analysis to look at the changing picture that takes place in every workforce? I, I appreciate that all of these exercises have their costs, but I, I would think this is likely to be inextricably linked with the, the staff satisfaction uh, aspect as well. In terms, in terms of... of, of um, a downgrading, as, as you characterise it, it's, it's, it is fair to say, and I think I mentioned this on the previous occasion, that the one place that there has been um, a significant shift in the organisation, since, particularly since 2010, is in the senior civil service. Um, and so from um, a position where there were 39, we're now down to 21. Um, and so be it. Um, but across the, other, across the other grades, the numbers are, are proportionately, approximately, as they were. To pick up on your specific point, though, uh, Mr Finney, in relation to the, the, the work about the changing profile and, and the response to that, I agree entirely. And I think that that um, fits entirely with, with, with the Lord Advocate's opening statement about recognising that we have actually experienced a change in the profile of work. And it's quite a significant one. Um, I, I don't know if, the, if, if um, uh, members of the, of the inquiry will recall, but at the creation of Police Scotland, um, again, I think I gave evidence to this effect previously, um, there was a massive spike in the number of reports that came in, and I think it went over 300,000 for the one and only time. And uh, that meant that there was an increased number of cases, particularly in the summary courts. What we're now seeing is a change in profile where the case numbers that are being reported are dropped, but, but actually the type of criminality that has been reported has changed. And it is very much more um, a criminality where uh, there is a requirement from the services perspective to provide support to vulnerable victims, etc., etc., and, and so therefore we do need to realign our resource in order to meet that challenge, which is a different one from even 1314. And so that is the work that the Lord Advocate has referred to, which has been commissioned, and that's something that we'll be looking at during the course of next year. 
Okay, f finally, if I may, uh, and full involvement for the trade unions in that exercise? Uh, in terms of the trade unions, um, uh, I personally meet with both unions once a month as a minimum. Um, all of my deputy crown agents meet with the unions once a month as a minimum. Across all of the sheriffdoms um, that we've referred to, um, there, are, there are meetings, I think I'm right in saying, four times a year. Um, with but are they actively involved in this review, Mr Harvey? Absolutely. Um, and, and, but they're also involved in fair, <coughs> fair futures. They're involved uh, across the range of issues. From my perspective, there are no surprises to them on any of the, the things that we're discussing. Okay, thank you very much. Mary Fee. <coughs> Good morning, panel. I too wanted to keep the focus on the issues of um, staff. Um, your workforce planning strategy suggests a reduction of around 200 full-time staff by 2022-23. Is, is that a figure that you're still content to, to, to say will happen? Um, well, that, that strategy of, or that um, projection was, of course, uh, predicated on a set of assumptions mm -hmm which included an assumption of flat cash mm -hmm. and, and certain uh, other assumptions. Now, um, the budget allocation this year um, allows us to depart from those assumptions and the, um, as it were, the, 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 future, um, the, the future strategy will itself have to revise um, to, to, to reflect the, uh, the change in the budget allocation this year. I don't know whether the Crown Agent wants to add anything. Um, the simple answer is yes. Um, so basically, um, uh, uh, um, members will recall that on previous occasion, as Lord Advocate said, the assumption was that it was flat cash and therefore um, uh, we anticipated that 50% of, of savings would have to be uh, secured um, from staffing. Um, as a result of this settlement, that doesn't apply this year, uh, for the coming year. Mm. Um, uh, because we will be in a position where we will have stability in relation to, to staff numbers and be in a position to make choices <coughs> in relation to, to, to filling posts that become vacant during the course of the next year. Okay, because, I mean, the, the, the Procurator's Fiscal Society have, have suggested that predicted job cuts will prove to be a Conservative estimate. Are they wrong, then, in that view? They, to, to be fair to them, um, they, they, they um, put in their submission in advance of, of the, the, the budget settlement, um, and I think that it's fair to say that they were um, uh, working on anticipation as per the plans, that, that, it, that it would be a flat cash uh, position. And I think that from their perspective, what they were looking at, you'll recall from the financial sustainability plan that we discussed previously, that we had certain assumptions in our planning. So our planning initially was 2.5% inflation, it's now 3 our planning was that it was 1% public sector pay. That has now been changed. And so from their perspective, what they were seeing was um, on the assumption against flat cash that inflation was increasing in public sector mm. pay policy had changed, which would increase pressure on our plans and therefore might mean that actually the, the, the losses were conservative. And so that was a perfectly logical and sensible position for them to adopt in the absence of the knowledge of, of, of what was eventual settlement. Thank you. Can I touch now on the issue of, of, of staff morale? Because I mean, I, I welcome the, the, the statement from the Lord Advocate in his opening remarks about the commitment of staff, and no one can doubt how, how committed staff within the, the, the service are. And I know you have the Fair Futures project, but reading through the submissions that we got for today, it's almost as if there are two completely comparing and contrasting views. When you have the FDA um, Procurator Fiscal Section saying that current resources are insufficient for the additional demands placed on and increased workloads of the service, and it's either time for the commitment to match the resources or those difficult decisions to be made about what aspects of the service and work that we, they will have to stop doing. Um, the uh, uh, survey... Um, some of the responses from the survey. One was adequate preparation time for trials is a rarity. Taking papers home is essential. A manager is reported feeling stressed to death. Employees are being effectively forced to deal with workloads in which it's nearly impossible to deliver an effective service. Um, and another submission has said, we want to provide a world-class service, but we simply have far too much work and not enough people. We have staff with no prep time for difficult and sensitive trials. We have staff in court day after day, working at home, coming in while on leave and constantly worrying about work. Now, I appreciate you're doing a number of different things, but if, if someone was to read those submissions and not read anything else, they would think you had a, a workforce that were completely demoralised, stressed 
and felt there was no, there was no future or, or fairness. What are you doing to address that? Um, well, and the Crown Agents already described a number of the specific actions that are, are being taken by the service in order to uh, address the issues. Um, um, Morale is quite a difficult thing to get, get a handle on, um, and I don't, as the Crown Agent did, I don't for a moment suggest that those aren't individuals who are accurately reporting their own, um, their, their own experience, their own um, it, it, it impression. Um, you know, I, 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 I detect enormous pride mm. in the staff whom I meet in the work that they're doing. Um, it's reflected in the commitment that they they give to their work, um, and it's and and if one's looking so far as one can for some sense of of of, of the broader picture, um, uh, it it is I think worth going back to those two figures in, in the staff survey. Of course, I would like them to be higher, but they are so much better than they were two years ago. Um, now, that's not for a moment to take away from what's being reported um, in the FDA, um, um, in the FDA's evidence. Um, all staff should have a one-to-one -one meeting with their manager um, once a month. Uh, in order to discuss workload and and, uh, and other issues, and as the Crown Agent has observed, there are regular meetings with the unions to uh, discuss issues of concern to them. So there are mechanisms in place to seek to address uh, particular issues. Crown Agent's already, I think, in his, his um, er earlier evidence, um, uh, made the point that when you do what I think in the we we'll come to discover it, it, it ought to be described as a deep dive into the staff survey figures. The one finds real discrepancies in different parts of the organisation, and you know that's something which um, uh, uh, the, the, the service um, is is looking at very seriously in terms of trying to respond to particular issues that uh, arise in particular parts of the organisation. Okay, Mr. Harvey, did you have any comment? <coughs> Unless there's anything further, I, I, th I think I covered most of that mm. earlier. If, if you're having meetings on a, a regular basis and you have all this work in place, why do staff still feel this way? If you're regularly communicating with them, you would expect them to feel their morale to, to rise and to feel better. Is there a gap in the way that what you are doing, is there a gap in the way that's being communicated to staff? Are staff not aware of what's going on? It's, it's, um, communication could always be better. That's one of the things I, I, I find generally. And so, for example, on the, the, the Fair Futures programme that's been referred to, um, we've actually got 80 volunteers um, who are um, um, you know, members of staff from across the service, self-nominated, self-selecting, who have, many of whom, frankly, have particular issues that they want to get resolved on precisely the kinds that are reflected in the survey, and that opportunity is being created for them. And I would regard them... Um, a, also as champions and evangelists in relation to precisely the kind of work that we're doing. So partly, as, as you, you know, members will be all too familiar, it's about communication from the centre or, or top or whatever you like to describe it, but actually, crucially, it's about cross-communication as well, about activity and about improvement and about exchange of ideas. And that is being encouraged under the Fair Futures programme so that people feel as if they have a voice. And I think I mentioned previously about, uh, for example, um, when we went to Hamilton recently, uh, again, an, an innovation which sounds like a small thing but has been significant is that every second of the executive board meetings is actually not in the Crown Office. It was always traditionally in the Crown Office. Now it goes around the country. And, and the, the, there, is, there is an open meeting with staff at each of those offices for as long as we like. They, they, they need... Um, and the, the meeting in Hamilton ran on um, uh, to half past three to, to discuss a whole series of issues from strategic issues affecting the service to the fact that th there was investment required on, on um, a, a printing and, and, and a, a copying facilities that to particular members of staff is actually the most insignificant and, and, and important inhibitor about them being able to, to do a, a, the job that they want to be able to do. And we've had those individuals then contributing towards the the, 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 the national um, uh, call-off contract in relation to the new printers and, and uh, copying facilities, that they can then see that they are actually making a contribution. It's that kind of thing 
that makes a difference of people feeling as if um, it, when they say something that they're listened to and actually they have an opportunity to have an impact on that and that has happened. So there isn't a single solution to that and we will always endeavour to, to, to improve communication in relation to what we're doing but also frankly to try and generate a sense of collective and we're on a journey, there's no doubt about that, we're on a journey in relation to this. Um, Lord Advocates referred to the, to the, the you know, where we, the position as was about, you know, so we got a 16% rise in relation to the point about the workload being acceptable, etc. It has now plateaued the good work-life balance. We got a rise and then that has plateaued. I was disappointed by that. Um, and that was an incentive for me to kick on again in relation to, to, to precisely these ways of, of, of communicating with staff. So I completely accept the point. And, and we will continue to, to, to try and find other ways of, of bringing that level of engagement. OK, thank you. And the next question I was going to ask, you, you, you've answered, Mr Harvey, and it was about if someone raises something, how effective are you at actually responding and feeding back? So you've answered that question. Trying to so, get better. Thank you. Ian McCarr. Uh, I would like to follow up on some of these, the, the, this line of questioning, um, particularly to begin with the, the workforce strategy. Uh, it was presumably argued at the time that 200 jobs could be shed without a significant negative increase on uh, the workload, on the work-life balance, and, and generally this could be absorbed within the organisation. Uh, now, of course, it looks like there's some extra money. Uh, now, of course, you're saying, uh, as, as I heard, uh, <coughs> there is not a need to shed 200 posts and uh, these will be looked to retain. But doesn't that suggest that these posts are, in fact, very necessary and that there would have been an impact and that the premise of the workforce strategy was wrong? Um, this was a projection of what we would have to do to live within our means if that was where we ended up. And I think I've indicated previously to the inquiry um, and members that it would become increasingly challenging and that the choices would become increasingly difficult. Um, and I think that, that what we would have found ourselves in a situation where um, I would have been um, uh, presenting uh, options to the Lord Advocate um, uh, uh, about uh, what a service at those levels might look like. And so is that uh, an acceptance that had the 200 posts had to go, that would have had a significant impact on the remaining staff's ability to deliver the service and their own uh, work-life balance, for example? I think what the Crown Agent's um, saying is that, um, and of course it would be subject to other changes in, the, in the, you know, both in the caseload and the broader system, but that um, one could foresee, um, one could have foreseen could have foreseen on that scenario um, the need for, as Grand Agent puts it, him to um, uh, come to me with, with, with options in terms of um, the various activities that the service undertakes. Now, we're not in that position um, uh, but because this year um, I, 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 the budget allocation has um, been increased in real terms. Now, that's not to say that the position going forward doesn't uh, contain challenges. It, it always contains challenges, not least because of the uh, way in which the workload uh, shifts, the caseload changes, and the services need to respond to that. It's a service that's shown a remarkable ability to, to, to effect change, certainly over my professional lifetime, and I'm sure we'll uh, con continue to do that. Um, um, the Crown Agent as he put it in his evidence to the, this committee's in, in inquiry, um, has, all, has been very clear that that uh, planning assumption of flat cash would present um, uh, an increasingly challenging position. Uh, I'm pleased that that's not the position that, uh, that, that we're in with the allocation that the service has been given this year. You're quite clear and, and quite right to point out that's this year. Uh, but then that, that begs a question around the level of consultation that's going on. Can I ask what, uh, what consultation was done uh, back when the original workforce strategy with the 200 posts was happening, and now what's going to happen now? Because, of course, 
people on the ground will be listening to this and saying, oh, hang on, we don't need to shed 200 posts. But what happens the year after that and the year after that? What's going to, what engagement? So, so um, you referred to the 200 posts. It was, um, so the, 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 the planning assumptions and the logic of the planning assumptions were that if um, a, a, those assumptions were correct, then the net outcome would be that even, it's even saving 50% on non-staff costs and 50% on staffing costs, there might be a net reduction of between 150 and 200 staff over a five-year period. And I indicated to the inquiry that that would be on average about 30 a year. And we've had a year where our staff numbers have reduced. And so, therefore, to the extent in relation to that plan and the assumptions that apply to that, the first year of that plan proves the accuracy, if you like, of the assumptions as they applied at that stage. What I'm saying to you is that um, in relation to this particular year, when we have a one-year um, uh, outcome, that, that does not apply. And what that enables us to do is that, the, particularly in relation to the non-staff costs, um, the non-staff costs um, uh, savings rather come on stream at different times because some of them involve negotiations with third parties, some of them involve opportunities in relation to lease breaks, etc., etc. And so there isn't an even distribution of opportunities, if you like, on non-staff savings each year. So as it happens, for next year, for example, the non-staff savings that are available are, sorry, sorry the year after next, um, the non-staff savings that are available projected could be double that which are expected next year. So that, that again gives us a bit more of a flexibility in relation to potential staffing costs. Now, it's difficult to look further than that, beyond that, and as we've indicated already, the caseload can change as well. So even since 13-14, from 300 and odd thousand cases with a different profile, we've now got um, a, a different number of cases, but frankly a different kind of caseload. And uh, you, frankly, the welcome increase in reporting of serious sexual offending because it was always there. Um, but we need to respond to that. So it, the, 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 there's a risk in looking at the, the, the workflows plan, the financial sustainability plan, in each of those in isolation. There are a number of variables, not only in respect of the opportunities that arise in relation to, to, to savings and budgetary changes, et cetera, et cetera. But also there are there are changes in the landscape about the nature of the the ask, for want of a better phrase, um, uh, for the organisation, depending upon the nature of the criminality that is reported to us and how we must profile our our, our response to that. So it's 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 dangerous to look too far ahead and and be, and be certain about that. And, and perhaps if I might, uh, if I may just add one other point that um, you know the the changing caseload significantly declining in numbers but changing in nature um, is, is one aspect of the environment um, within which the service has to operate and which it has to, in which it has to uh, fulfill its essential public function. At the same time, there is a, a, a process of criminal justice reform which, has the, which presents a set of opportunities to do things more, 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 more efficiently and in a better way. Uh, we've, in the past year, we've um, uh, implemented summary, uh, um, sheriff and jury reform. I think you've uh, got some figures in the correspondence that we've sent in advance uh, of, of this meeting, um, which uh, in, you know, are the early indications that sheriff and jury reform is having a producing significant benefits in terms of cases settling at a, or resolving at an earlier stage uh, uh, more often, uh, and also very significant, a very significant benefit to uh, the public in terms of witnesses not being cited unnecessarily. Now that's the sheriff and jury reform bit of the picture. We're in our process of work on summary justice reform, which as the committee will appreciate is, is, is as it were, the, the, the volume part of the, the work of the service. Uh, and again, there are, and, and we discussed this during the uh, inquiry into the work of the service, there are real opportunities um, in the, um, relation to summary justice for that, that, that part of the um, caseload of the court and the work of the service to be done in a significantly more efficient and effective way. Now, if we can secure real change in the summary justice system, that will have a significant impact on the 
pressures on the service. And one of the, one of the challenges is, um, you know, um, uh, uh, in terms of future strategy is to anticipate when those opportunities and benefits will actually turn into uh, real, real changes. Um, another um, example of, of, of the kind of thing that um, you know, can make a, a difference in terms of reducing the workload um, is the uh, proposition in relation to Road Traffic Act fixed penalty offences, which again is in, referred to in the Crown Agent's correspondence with the committee. Now, there's, uh, there we have you know, um, uh, upwards of 15,000 cases, which currently we prosecute in a summary uh, prosecution, um, um, where uh, in England and Wales, the enforcement uh, is dealt with in a different way, which doesn't require a, a prosecution. Now, it will be a matter for consultation whether bringing, you know, approaching those cases in a different way in Scotland uh, is appropriate or not. But if, but if that consultation um, produces a positive uh, answer to that, then that, again, reduces the, the, the pressures on the service. So, you know, it, it, it's one of the um, immensely, um, one, it's, it's one of the, the challenging features of future planning for the service, that the landscape changes. We can see uh, real opportunities to do things more effectively, more efficiently, to do them better in terms of serving the public, which is ultimately what uh, uh, we, 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 we want to do. Um, but the timescale for those, um, you know, is not always entirely predictable or within our, our hands. One final point from me then, if I may. The, uh, you talk about the caseload changing and the differing profile uh, leads to a reduction uh, in the caseload potentially, but uh, the individuals involved, the staff involved with dealing with that necessarily require to be retrained then uh, to, to understand what the new caseload that they're dealing with. That will come at a cost that will come at a cost in, in financial uh, terms, but also in staff time uh, and their ability to deliver a service and be taken off to be retrained. What planning is going on around that? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right that, that, that um, uh, staff need to be um, appropriately trained, particularly um, when it comes to uh, uh, the, the dealing with uh, serious sexual offence cases, which are the, those, those which are um, on the increase. Um, a, one of the, the, the things which um, we had been doing in advance um, a, a, of this, this um, significant change in, in the trend was looking at ways in which uh, we could um, uh, simplify our current processes. We had um, uh, historically responded to the change in serious sexual offending by uh, reference to specialist Crown Council who were appropriately trained and over periods of time the teams who are reporting those cases into, the, into Crown Council have themselves become expert um, and that has been a real benefit and so it was one of the, 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 the helpful parts of, of, of the inspectorate's report on, on, on those matters was to, to confirm that actually there really is that sense of, of, of expertise and actually there's no significant disagreement between um, Crown Council and those who are providing um, the recommendations to them. That's testament to the, the response over a period of time that there's, there is that level of upskilling. Um, so there's an opportunity there to say, well, actually, those people now understand and, and we can rely on those choices and those recommendations and potentially have, have a different reporting structure uh, in relation to those cases. But beyond that, there, there is undoubtedly a requirement to, to, to train up additional staff in order to be able to deal with that, that spike. Um, or not spike, that, that trend in, in relation to um, a, the increase in reporting. But also, um, and this is an important factor, and it comes back to the welfare point, um, it, it, we, would, we should only expect staff to, to, to be involved in that kind of work for periods of time um, uh, subject to appropriate support. So it's not just about training. It's making sure that there are, there are opportunities for them to, to, to have other roles and then perhaps come back or perhaps not. And so um, one of the key things we need to do is not only make sure that we have um, the capacity to deal with the casework, but we actually have the capacity to deal with um, a, a staff response to, to, to that casework and, and make sure that their welfare is supported, because it can be very challenging dealing with that kind of casework. So that, I can provide a reassurance, is recognised, and that's one of the things that we'll be addressing.
There's um, a direct follow-up from Ben McPherson on the training aspect, then two supplementaries on the staffing from Liam MacArthur and Maurice Corey. Ben. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Yeah. I wanted to pick up on something that's related, as the Convener says, which is also something that came up in the inquiry that the, the committee did, um, based around people being the greatest asset for the service, future-proofing the service, increasing future capacity, and adapting to the, the different demands on the services, as has just been touched on. And that is the question of, of trainees. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could give the committee an update on uh, the number of trainee places available. Is that still on the increase? Um, and what the anticipated retention of trainees is in the year ahead in order to continue that future proofing? Um, so uh, three uh, very quick points in relation to that. Um, we're, we are, for the first time, um, uh, bringing in a second tranche, and so rather than simply uh, bringing in um, all the trainees in August, we're now going to, as of February of this year, bring in a, a small group in February, and we will increase that. And over the course of the next two years, we will have a February tranche and an August tranche, um, which overall will mean, actually, that the numbers will slightly increase. And part of the reason for that is because um, we've, we found, and again this came out in the inquiry and, and has been accepted for, for many years, that actually it's an, an excellent way of recruiting future staff. I think I mentioned previously that all three deputy Crown agents are former trainees. You know, many of the previous Crown agents are former trainees and, and get very, very high quality people in. Um, and so um, it, what, we, what we were finding was that um, because we were bringing people in in the August, um, a, we, we would wait until till, towards that period to board for new deputies, which meant that classically we would have a dip in the numbers of deputies during the summer. Um, so if we, if we bring in two tranches and we have vacancies, then we'll be able to advertise them and our trainees coming off in February would then be in a position to apply for those posts and then we'll have more consistency of availability of legal staff throughout the course of the year. Whereas historically, if you look, we do tend to have a bit of a wave pattern where it dips in, in the summer, which is not helpful because that's when people want to take their holidays, which is completely understandable. We still need to man the courts. So that's the first thing, is that um, uh, we're, we're, we're splitting the tranches and the numbers that will, will actually slightly increase. The second thing is that, that again, uh, for many years, we've paid the Law Society recommended rate. This year, we've agreed a deal where, um, it, it, frankly, at my behest, that's being increased. Um, uh, so we're paying above that rate um, uh, for the first time in many years. And the third thing is that um, a pair the opportunity for there to be a stable um, a workforce as a result of this of, of this budget. What that means is that as and when opportunities arise in relation to, to legal vacancies, um, there will be the opportunity to fill those and so therefore the trainees will be in a position to compete for those. I can't say what the numbers will be, um, but they will certainly be in a position to complete for those and that those vacancies will now be um, uh, capable of being addressed. Thank you. And that much of that is, is reassuring. If you, if, in due course, Crown Agent, if you could keep us of course, uh, up to of date course, on, very on, happy on train, to. trainee uh, numbers and, and, and anticipated retention. Just very briefly, um, the convener, if I may, the, one of the strengths I know of the, uh, the services traineeship is uh, it's highly regarded with, with throughout the profession. And um, that will be down to a number of factors, but I imagine one of them will be that there is adequate mentoring from uh, senior staff within the service uh, for trainees in order to, to, to pass on that knowledge and understanding and, and expertise to the next generation. Given the constraints we've heard around uh, challenges around work-life balance and, and, and other challenges within the, the staffing of the service, are there adequate systems in place? And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful there will be in order to make sure that that mentoring time is protected in order to make sure that tr the traineeship of the service retains that uh, highly regarded reputation which so, it currently has. So one of the advantages of the numbers is that, that, that during the two-year training period there's actually quite a significant commitment for, for spells out um, for specific training programmes that are provided um, within the organisation and so um, it's, it's not a case of um, you, you're there for a two-year traineeship, but actually you're entirely office-based working with others for that period. There are, um, a, over the course of the two years, quite significant spells where 
they are out and, and, and actually getting um, a specific training during that period. And you're quite right, there are also um, uh, opportunities um, uh, on a daily basis to have a mentoring and support um, uh, from um, a legal staff. And I think, again, that's perhaps one of the benefits of the fact that actually a very substantial number of, of our current legal staff are themselves former trainees. That, frankly, is, has created a whole culture of supporting each other. People will talk about, you know, they were the intake of such and such a year as opposed to that year. And, and, and there is generally that, that investment in, 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 in people um, a, who, are, who are the new trainees, precisely because we have quite a high retention of former trainees. Thank you. OK. Supplementary, Liam McCarter, then Maurice Corr. Thanks so much. Good morning. Um, just come back to the line of questioning Liam Kerr was adopting um, earlier on. Uh, obviously, we're in the, the fortunate position at the moment of looking at a, a budget settlement that is, uh, is more advantageous than I think was uh, anticipated. Uh, Twelve months ago, though, um, on the back of a cut in real terms to the, to the budget, there was a discussion, a recall between whether or not this was, as the FDA uh, described, absolutely astonishing or a sound uh, settlement, as uh, I think both the Minister and, and the Lord Advocate uh, agreed. I think my concerns are that while the happy circumstances of, of looking at the pay increases and, and no requirement to deliver the reductions in staffing that were being considered at that point, and I think without um, uh, demurring from the, the, the notion that it was entirely incumbent upon you to be scenario planning for, for, for different anticipated scenarios, I am slightly concerned that, in a sense, we were being um, reassured that these staffing reductions could be accommodated without you having to go to the Lord Advocate with some fairly unpalatable um, uh, uh, suggestions about what this would mean in terms of service delivery. Now, we don't want to invite those to come before us needlessly scaremongering, but nor do we need um, witnesses coming before us whistling to keep our spirits up. And therefore, I think I, my concern would be the assurances we were be given 12 months ago um, I, I don't seem to me as well founded as they were being portrayed at the at the time. Perhaps I could just say something on on that verse. Um, I think I was very clear last year that with the budget settlement that we had last year, I I could fulfil my public responsibilities. I was also very clear, as I think any leader of any public service um, in Scotland would. Uh, w w w w w would be that um, uh, I think I put, uh, put it this way: you know, would, I, w w would I like to have more funding? Of course, I would like to have more funding. Um, can I provide the service that I'm responsible for with the settlement that I had last year? And I believe that I could, and we have done that over the past year. You know, we have prosecuted crime effectively up and down Scotland. Um, uh, in the course of the last year. So, um, uh, 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 and looking forward, um, we, the service was scenario planning on an assumption of flat cash, recognising that with justice reform there would be changes in the system and uh, so on and so forth. Crown Agent, I think, was very clear that the... Um, scope for choice um, would become increasingly challenging and um, that I think the, the I, I think one could put it this way were, were, were you know were, were one unable to unlock um, some of the benefits of, of justice reform then no doubt I would, uh, he would be coming to me facing me with uh, difficult uh, choices. Thankfully, we're not in that position. Um, Indeed, and, I, and I appreciate that. And, and I think we all accepted that um, justice reform proposals were about Im improving the, um, the way in which the system yes. works, as well as um, getting more for the resources that were, being, that were put in. But what we weren't being told was that um, the staff and reductions we were, we were being presented with were likely to lead to scenarios where services may need to be um, uh, scaled back or, 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 or removed entirely. And I think as a committee, we would have responded very differently had we not simply been being told that by FDA and others, but actually from the Crown Office themselves, mm -hmm. who'd say, look, we, we don't entertain the more lurid examples of what this may mean, but be under no um, illusions. If, if, 
if as we go through this process, we reach this level of staff reduction, we are going to have to look at some um, potentially uncomfortable um, reductions or, or scaling mm -hmm. back in, in, in service. Yes. Uh, well, Perhaps if I may, forgive me, that wasn't my intention, nor with my answer to Mr. Kerr. The, 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 I did say that it would be more challenging. And I did say that it would be increasingly more challenging um, and that the options would become um, uh, more constrained. We did, as Lord Advocate has said, though, also talk about the potential for um, other changes in the landscape. And so, for me, I was answering Mr Kerr's question on the basis, again, of, you will recall, making mention of the fact that it was dangerous to compare you know, one position, one scenario with another. So, for example, when I did say about the changing casework from 13, 14, to now and the projections forward about potential changes in casework going forward, um, that would be, for example, as a result of reform, where, for example, um, if we had a, 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 a change in legislation in relation to the number of cases um, that are reported for road traffic, just as one small example, then that could potentially change the, the, the JP Court programme, which would then create the flexibility or perhaps the opportunity for the realisation of the kind of pressure that we're talking about. So, when I, you, when I say about options, it's a, you, they are at, a, at a, a, a macro level in relation to, to system change, but if the timings were not um, a, a appropriate or possible in relation to legislative change or, or reform, etc., then it might well have been that, that it would have been necessary to, to make other choices, but it's a constantly moving picture is, the, is what I was trying to convey to Mr Kerr. Um, Maurice Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, Lord Advocate and Crown Agent. Uh, what um, percentage of management ab absences on sick leave are classified as long-term and are due to stress, and what steps are you taking to uh, remedy this and reduce it? Um, Crown Agent. I don't Particularly have the, senior management. Uh, I don't have the figure for senior management uh, to hand, and, and uh, particularly in relation to long-term, um, but we'll undertake to provide that to the committee. Um, I can say um, uh, the figure that I do have in relation to that is that um, a, a, the, the sickness absence figure um, a, a, in relation to uh, work-related stress is about 8%. That's, okay. a, that's across the board, though not specific to senior management. I don't have that figure, but I will give it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, I was going to ask a wee bit about the, um, the draft budget and the impact that could have on the savings, but I think that's really been covered uh, quite extensively. What I would like to ask is, one of the things that I'd um, questioned about during the inquiry was in relation to the use of diversion schemes. Um, going forward and given the, uh, the savings that are required, have you any thought how diversion schemes could be used, perhaps more e economically, to, to free up some of the, the clutter, as it was referred to, um, in the system? Um, have you any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm... I, 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 yeah, I, value the option of diversion where that's available. I think, as I said to the committee during the inquiry, um, prosecutors can only um, decide to um, uh, go for a diversion rather than some other prosecutorial action if, there is a, if there's an appropriate and good quality diversion scheme available. Um, so, you know, the use by the service of diversion scheme depends on the availability of diversion schemes across the country. The introduction of Community Justice Scotland provides an opportunity for um, uh, improving the availability of diversion schemes um, and also, I, I hope, um, ensuring that opportunities for diversion are available um, across the whole country, because one of the um, from a prosecutorial perspective, one of the things that one observes is that the availability of diversion varies um, in different parts of the country, and you know, that affects the decisions that prosecutors make in relation to particular um, reports of, of, of alleged crimes in different parts of the country. Now, if we can uh, improve the availability of diversion, then um, prosecutors will you will will see that uh, will 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 use those diversion schemes um, a, a, as appropriate. 
Um, there is perhaps a more general point about the range of options that are available to prosecutors. Um, um, as the committee is aware, prosecutors have a, um, a, a number of options uh, available to them by statute um, in addition to prosecution and think of fiscal fines, uh, fiscal work orders uh, and the like. Um, and it's, uh, th those are valuable options which prosecutors um, in appropriate cases uh, use and, uh, and should use in order to respond appropriately and proportionately to um, particular um, uh, reports of offending behaviour. Yeah. I was actually going to ask that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just for reassurance for the committee, the numbers are still relatively small. But um, in, in, so from 11-12, it was 0.5% um, of cases went um, for diversion. Um, and it's now um, gradually creeping up where this year it looks as if it's going to be about 1.2. So it's still relatively small, but it, on one view it has doubled um, as, a, as a proportion over, over um, a period of four or five years. It has gradually been creeping up, but there's certainly, as the Lord Advocate has said, um, the potential for more uh, subject to the availability. Yeah, well, I was actually going to ask about the changes to the justice system, what opportunities that might present for um, more diversion schemes being used. And I wonder if you're able to expand on any thoughts that you've had of how those conversations and discussions might unfold um, moving forward. Well, um, you know, from a prosecutorial perspective, um, you know, prosecutors look at the, the range of options that are available. Um, you know, the, the uh, greater the availability of diversion schemes, the more um, confidence that we can have in the quality of diversion schemes, the more, uh, uh, the more viable that will be as an option in appropriate cases. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, as I said a moment ago, I think the establishment of Community Justice Scotland is an opportunity um, for enhancing the availability of diversion schemes. It's not something we are, we can, we are responsible for, no. um, although we're part of, the, part of the discussion, as you put it, with Community Justice Scotland in, order, in terms of what's are, are, are available. And, and, and perhaps um, specifically, um, it, it may assist um, members to know that, that um, uh, we, we meet um, uh, with, with each of the partnerships um, um, uh, regularly, and in particular, we are very keen um, for them to explore um, a consistently available measures in relation to, to those with mental health issues, and that's something that um, uh, we, we will continue to push. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, perhaps just yes, one point I should make is that what we are interested in is, is uh, making the right decisions in individual cases, to, you know, having, an, having options which are appropriate, and where it's appropriate to do so, we will prosecute the case. Where it's appropriate for a diversion, then we, we, we welcome the availability of a diversion uh, uh, as an alternative. Yeah, I think there's no doubt that there's a potential for diversion schemes to be um, you know, more equalised over the country as a whole and more consistent and also um, you know, I think local authorities and, and other stakeholders have a big role to play in that but I suppose what I'm asking in terms of today's debate um, is about because th this is about the budget scrutiny and the, and the financial situation and obviously if diversion schemes could be used more and were more available and understand that's not uh, obviously your issue for the, in terms of the availability then is there any thought how that could possibly impact the budget, I would hope, positively, um, the, the financial situation facing the service, sorry? Well, yeah. uh, sorry. I, well, I suppose that what, what occurs to me is that, that um, there's always the risk of, of, of um, transferring the burden. Um, and, and so, therefore, I think, I think we need to, to, to understand in context of overall budget that that was something that, that brought an overall efficiency to the system. But, I, but if one was looking at it through the budgetary lens, um, but, but candidly, if it's the right thing to do, then we should be finding a way. Okay, thanks. I just want a, a quick a supplementary. It's a, quite a specific a, area um, regarding the office is at Airdrie, so I, I'm the representative for Cobridge and Chryson, so obviously Airdrie's very nearby. It would have an impact to know how busy that particular office is. Um, I, I've read through what the submission says, and can I just confirm that it is a change in terms of the size of the unit, rather than, as opposed to a staff reduction on the site? Um, so we, we entered into um, uh, negotiations with the landlord 
um, um, and uh, uh, secured uh, secured a deal that, that resulted in in, in uh, savings in, in non-staff costs, and um, it meant that we were able to maintain the, uh, the same sort of presence in, in the Airdrie area. So, um, I think there is there is one part um, that um, more to do with the the. Um, the activity of the, of the particular individuals or the particular team, um, a, and it's a very small number, I think it might even be three or four, which may be better um, placed in Hamilton, but that's not as a result of the, the change in footprint. It's about more to do with the, um, where it's best to have a team for, you know, that are co-located. Okay. Okay. Rona McCann. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, my questions on uh, financial strategy have largely been answered, so I wonder if I could take you down a different road, and that is victim information and advice. Um, a submission from Victims Support Scotland says the impact on victims could be better prioritised, and they argue for a single point of contact. And that's something we heard echoed uh, a lot during our evidence taking for the inquiry. And they also suggest that they may be able to do more to assist um, in conjunction with your own victim information and advice service. So can you tell me if you've had any discussions with victim support on this and if you favour, if you would favour a single point of contact? Um, well, I think, I think um, we, we support the um, direction of travel indicated by in, the Les, in Leslie Thompson's review, which is to, to, to a single point of contact. I mean, we recognise that um, the service has an important role to play in supporting and providing information to victims, supporting them specifically in the context of the criminal justice process, but that there is a real limit to what it's either appropriate or possible for prosecutors to do, and the needs of victims go well beyond uh, 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 what we can provide. It's fair to say, as prosecutors, we also recognise the uh, value to victims of having um, a, a support worker or an advocacy worker who, 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 uh, who, who, who is there uh, uh, to support them through the process. So we see, we see, and I think it's reflected in the inspectorate report, the value that uh, victims uh, obtain f from, uh, from that kind of uh, support when it's available. Um, uh, there is work uh, in hand. I think there's some information in the correspondence about um, the uh, work that Scottish Government's doing to take forward the uh, Thompson Review. Um, and uh, the, you know, that's work with which the service is very closely uh, closely involved. Um, I don't know whether, Craig, is there anything you want to, to add? I think, I think the, 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 the phrase that's used is the one front door model. Mm. Um, and because I think that what we have to acknowledge is that there are um, a, a number of, of, of very, very valuable services um, available um, uh, across the country um, which um, are able to, to support individuals who have uh, particular needs, and, and I think that those, the ro their role needs to be recognised. So I think that that was reflected in the, in the discussion that the Scottish Government um, chaired in September, and, and really um, uh, uh, what um, uh, that's looking to, to, to explore, um, and as Lord Advocate has said, um, um, uh, we support in, in terms of the, the original proposition in the Thompson Review, is, is that that um, um, uh, one front door um, uh, for victims and witnesses who then um, I, I, I are um, uh, guided through the supports that are available rather than necessarily the, the services being provided by one provider. Okay, well, that's encouraging because I think from our uh, inquiry report we highlighted the fact that victims often feel confused and not sure which way to go and you know there just seem to be different pathways. So if that was... Um, to come forward, I think that would be very welcome. Okay. Thank you. Maggie Fuchel. Thank you, Really just some questions about IT and uh, the use of IT. Um, when you talk about in the digital strategy that improvements in the use of IT must optimise resources and deliver efficiency. Um, are you able to tell us what the main areas are where you can see those efficiency savings and when, what the level of those savings will be and when that's anticipated to come through? Um, 
So um, there are a variety of, of, of uh, different uh, uh, digital um, uh, developments. I think I've, uh, in the correspondence, referred to the case management in court, the tablets in court, um, and uh, as one example, and we intend to, to, to roll that out during the course of, of the, the next um, calendar year. Um, it, the savings from that um, are um, really quite straightforward and, and, and fundamental, so therefore um, a, we anticipate that there will be savings in paper costs, there will be savings in storage costs, there will be uh, saving, savings in time, etc., all of which add up. Um, and um, the expectation, for example, in relation to the case management and court project is that um, it, it in and of itself, um, um, a couple of years after launch, will have achieved about um, £800,000 worth of, of savings of that ilk, um, um, simply as a result of, of, of that introduction. Um, and, and overall, given the, the number of, of different reforms that we have, a lot, a lot of which are, are underwritten, if you like, by digital reform, we anticipate that about 1.5 million of the savings over the next period um, will be as a result of digital reform. But there will be things like, as I say, stationary paper and, 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 and storage. Storage costs are very significant. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. But, um, one thing that was quite interesting recently as a committee, uh, we met with our uh, corresponding committee in Westminster. We'd also had the opportunity to meet the inspector of the, the CPS down there. And it was actually really interesting to hear about some of the things that, that they're doing uh, in terms of the use of IT. Uh, I, d I don't know if much of if some of what they're doing just now is what you're already looking at to implement in the future. But I mean, do you look to other examples uh, and things that are in operation elsewhere to see if that's something that could be implemented here? So, so I'm, I meet with the, the DPPs of England, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland twice a year um, and we discuss and are aware of developments um, and, and, and exchange um, a, a proposals and ideas uh, at those discussions. But, but beyond that, that then leads to um, a, 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 a frankly technical experts um, going and visiting and understanding and sharing and so we've had um, a, a people from CPS coming up to, to look at, for example, um, our disclosure website. Conversely, um, we've had people going down and looking at the facilities that they have available in the courts. Um, so there, there is, I can provide assurance there is that mutual exchange and, and learning. Okay, thank you very much. And I just have one final question, and it's about some of the evidence that we received um, from PCS and some of the concerns that they had. Um, um, they said in their evidence to us that there seems to be very little transfer of knowledge from contractors to our IT staff when carrying out major work. This means that we are constantly paying a high level of expenditure for contractors at a premium rate. We would have hoped that COPFS would have arranged more skills knowledge transfer in an area where expense can be considerable. Is that something that's actively being looked at, and how would you respond to the concerns that they've expressed? Um, it, it is uh, actively um, uh, being looked at and has actually um, a, I'm, I'm not sure that it's quite an accurate reflection of, of what the contractors are expected to do or indeed are, are, are currently doing. There is a knowledge transfer. It's part of what's written in um, uh, in terms of it and, and they, they regularly will um, not only explain what they're doing but then um, in some instances um, it, it takes seminars etc. What I can however say is that, that um, as part of the, the, the um, strategy going forward in relation to the particular uh, types of IT improvements that we, we have identified that we will need to make over the coming period, um, we will um, uh, increase our, our, our own IT resource um, and part of that will be as a result, um, involve um, a reduced reliance on contractors, but we will still always have a requirement for contractors for very particular specialist skills. Okay, thank you very much. I wonder if I could ask uh, what assessment has been done of the impact of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, which the FDA has said introduces a broad range of changes to policing which will directly impact on the work of the COPFS? Um, well, um, yes, uh, uh, Convener, as you observe, um, there are um, changed processes in the Act for um, uh, around um, detention um, and liberation um, and uh, procedures which are, will be new procedures to the court. Um, I, I, I think the answer is that um, uh, some work has been done. I'll let the Crown Agent look at the uh, explain the the, uh, the detail. What, there is some, inevitably there's uncertainty in predicting just how these procedures will be used and also the extent to which there will be um, 
uh, as it were, savings in other uh, uh, aspects of the Act. But uh, perhaps the Crown Agent can give a more detailed so response. It, um, uh, members will recall that this, this legislation was, was, was considered in um, Parliament some time ago, and there was a, there was a um, financial memorandum, as always, associated with that that addressed um, the anticipated or projected um, a, 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 a costs um, from a COPFS perspective in relation to the procedures that the FDA are talking about. But as the Lord Advocate has alluded to, it, it is a best guess um, and, and it's, it's, it's informed, but it, it, um, it, it is a best guess. And so the, the, nothing has changed since that financial memorandum in relation to the potential impact. I don't have it in front of me, but my recollection was that it was something between two and three hundred thousand pounds worth of 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 um, a, a, a what was I think were described um, as opportunity costs um, 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 as a result of the changes that the FDA are alluding to, but those weren't the only changes. And and one of the things that that um, a, I, I think will um, a, over time um, assist um, the the COPFS, but the justice system more, more generally, is that um, as a result of the change in legislation and as a result of the, the use of investigative liberation, and in particular the very explicit reference in the legislation to the presumption in favour of liberty, um, there is an expectation that fewer people will be reported from custody and that there will be um, a, 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 a more who will be on investigative liberation and therefore um, a, the quality of the reports um, will, will, will likely improve, which will then improve the decision making. Because one of the, again, we explored this in the inquiry, one of the remarkable things um, about the, the system is the way in which the police are able to, um, a, a, on an individual night, um, a, a, a deal with an individual on the street, bring them to the cells and thereafter, frankly, do the paperwork so that it's ready for the Crown to consider in the morning as a custody case. Um, and so um, my expectation um, uh, is that, that um, the, there will be a system level change in relation to um, the, the number of cases that are reported from custody over a period of time that will have its own benefits. To get back to my original question, has any assessment been done of this other than looking at the financial uh, memorandum? The financial memorandum remains the position and the projections are that, as a, that there will be a significant drop in the customs. So for the avoidance of doubt, no assessment has been done of the impact of this new legislation um, which will, ha according to FDA, have additional work um, for prosecutors and processes. One big change, the impact, which has not yet been assessed, is the introduction of police investigating liberation uh, and the right of review. Such reviews will yeah. be dealt with no, by what, the prosecutor. What I, what I said was the financial memorandum analysis stands. That hasn't changed because we have no better information than then. But you have done no assessment to see how that will affect workload. Because my problem here is yeah. um, both the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent have come and said, we value our staff. We realise that working with our staff and keeping them in the loop is absolutely essential for the smooth running of a, a service. And here's a, a huge piece of legislation which is going to impact significantly on their workload. And if I'm hearing you properly, there has been no assessment, no assessment directly taken of how that's going to end police on what, what is already an overburdened workload within the Crown Procurator. No, well, we're, we're, we're here to talk about uh, budgets. I answered from a budgetary perspective. There has been significant training exercise conducted. There is ongoing uh, provision in relation to guidance uh, in relation to, to, to this. Um, people will be uh, well prepared uh, for it and it has been uh, accommodated as part of the, the launch and is being led up to um, internally um, as, as, uh, with a series of, of communications and training events over a period of time. Um, so forgive me if, if, for answering it in budgetary terms, but it's, it's certainly something that has um, been subject to, uh, led by our policy group, a significant piece of work in anticipation of the introduction of the legislation. So it has been assessed what impact this will have on their workload? Well, the, the, the assessment of the impact in terms of the number of cases that we anticipate getting is, it remains the same. I, I remain less than convinced. Um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a supplementary, John Finney, and if the Lord Advocate wants to add anything to it. It was specifically in relation to that, and 
just as a, a lay person, my reading of it would be if there's less people appearing for custody, there's less of a commotion in the morning to get all these custodies dealt with. So there's less pressure on you rather than more pressure on you as a result of this in, in, in investigation. I think that was really the point yeah. the Crown Agent was seeking to make, and, and perhaps it's important to separate out two different things. One is, has the service carried out an assessment of the, um, the, the, the impact in terms of the particular procedures we're talking about? An assessment w was carried out in order to inform the financial memorandum, and that remains the assessment um, that, there's, as the, the Crown Agents made clear, there's no update to give to the committee on that. Separately is the question of preparation for the uh, introduction of these new procedures. And as the Crown does um, with, 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 with any significant change in procedure, um, of course there is preparation put in place in terms of um, uh, staff training, could, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, the, the Crown agents mentioned that. Um, precisely how the balance will work out in terms of the, the benefits of fewer people coming from custody um, against the new procedures you know, is, is, is at this stage difficult to predict. I mean, that, that there will be a benefit in terms of fewer people coming from custody is something that I think those of in, in the system can, can anticipate. Um, uh, and, and we'll just have to see how, uh, how, how that unfolds. And, and, frank, and frankly, also a benefit for the individuals concerned yes. because the officers involved will have had more time to prepare the report mm -hmm. and the prosecutors will have more time to consider the case than would be the case when, they're, when they are presented with, as we've, we've spoken about during the inquiry, the most pressurised time is, is on receipt of the custody, classically also on a Monday morning or after a holiday weekend where they are particularly significant. So this should help uh, to, to address that over time. Liam, uh, Liam McArthur. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just want to um, go back to um, a question raised by Fulton McGregor in relation, in his instance, to um, what was happening in Airdrie. Obviously, a large part of the, the, the cost reduction we were discussing um, previously is in non-staff costs and, and uh, in large part through the estate strategy, I think, where you've stated that there are there is significant scope uh, to reduce expenditure and that we've set very, uh, a very ambitious target uh, f in that regard. I was just interested to know what weighting is given um, to issues around local access to justice in, in those circumstances. In a numbers game, um, it's very easy to, to perhaps see where um, cost reduction might be achieved, but in terms of, of local access to justice, um, I, I would hope that there is a significant weighting given to that. Um, per, per, perhaps I can, uh, it's important right at the outset, and then I'll let the Crown Agent speak to the specifics, um, to make clear that um, what we are looking at is the office accommodation arrangements made for Crown Office staff. Um, um, the state strategy is firmly set in a context of a commitment to serving local courts, um, prosecuting local cases in local mm -hmm. courts all across Scotland. Um, and changes in the office accommodation um, uh, you know, are um, necessarily, therefore, um, necessarily, therefore, have to uh, include um, a, a careful assessment of, uh, to make sure that we can maintain our commitment to serving local courts across Scotland. Now, we've seen in, in the decisions that have been made this year, um, uh, 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 with the exception of one location, um, uh, what's happened is a, a shrinkage of the, of the footprint or, or a move to a different location um, in order to release savings against a background where uh, I think um, the committee heard during its inquiry that the um, the overall footprint of, of office space um, accom um, which the service has you know, is significantly greater than the, 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 the needs of the, for the number of staff. So uh, I think it's important not to, um, uh, not to um, read a, a, an estate strategy approach in reducing the office footprint for any want of commitment or loss of commitment to delivering local justice in local courts. That will sometimes result in staff, you know, may, may result in staff um, 
uh, re 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 relocations, but, 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 but the ability to serve the local court will remain an important part of the thinking. I don't know, Crown Agent, if you want to add anything. There's nothing I want to add to that. I, I suppose it, it would be helpful to say that the decision's already made um, in relation to the offices listed. Um, projecting ahead to um, the financial year after next, that would already realise um, £720,000 worth of, of, of non-staff savings from the decisions already made. Um, and um, so it's to indicate there's a, a level of progress in relation to, to those savings, but the considerations that the Lord Advocate has mentioned um, are, are absolutely front and centre, and I hope that the committee will take reassurance by the fact that whilst there was a list of offices that were um, and locations that were up for consideration, the, the, the decisions were taken to, to, um, in the majority of those situations to, to seek to remain in, um, in those locations, and, and um, that resulted in, in negotiations which resulted in, in um, a more beneficial rates um, uh, for the public sector. Um, and so that, that would continue to be our, our, our approach to these matters, but, but absolutely front and centre, making sure that, that local justice and local courts remain um, priority. Okay. And, and I think it follows that where um, we do, where the service does um, close an office in a particular location. So in, in Stirling, the office, which is at, was at the edge of town, not in the centre of town, that that office is closing and staff being relocated. The question of um, staff travel to serve a local court and the uh, arrangements that will be made for that are very much part of the analysis before any decision of that sort is taken. Uh, and indeed, um, um, engagement with the staff involved has also been uh, an important part of what the service has done in relation to the decisions that have been made uh, in the course of this year. And if, with, with convener's indulgence, there's one further matter I would like to, to highlight, which actually, and, and Open is a good example of this, but there, there are many others in the pipeline of um, the court service have been very helpful and cooperative in um, uh, assisting us in, in, in ensuring that as we make those plans, that they are very, very heavily involved in ensuring that we maintain that local um, a, a presence where possible. So, for example, they themselves are looking to their own accommodation to see whether or not they have existing capacity in certain locations that may be of use in the future. Um, just one final point. In the inquiry, then, there was a, a feeling that perhaps this, the, the composition of the, the service was a little top-heavy with senior prosecutors. Could you clarify where the, the 20 uh, job losses, staff losses, have come from this year? Um, so, um, I think from recollection, there, was a, there were um, a... Let's see the figures. I think there was... We'd, was it 534 prosecutors and, and it was 528 um, is the current number. Um, my recollection is that the PFD and SPFD grade um, is, as of today, and bearing in mind it fluctuates, I think um, five or six down on, on the, the point when, we, when, we, when there was written evidence to the inquiry. Um, so I can't recall what the exact number was. It was 300 that, and something. That was maybe something you could um, Yes, I will, but I think, I think from recollection on... it's five or six down, but yeah. it's, it's, it, it is a fluctuating picture. It has been higher since then, um, and, and currently, as of today, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's six lower, but it's, it's, it's broadly, broadly the same sorts of numbers as they were. Okay. And finally, then, given that the pressure is at the coalface, I don't think we're any um, doubt about that. I wonder if you could comment on just one last um, part of the FDA submission, that there was a strength of feeling among members that they're bearing workloads which are such they are increasingly unable to deliver an effective service and are fearful of mistakes being made. Well, um, I, I've pointed to the, um, to the data in the staff survey um, uh, in terms of the response on workload and a work-life uh, balance. Um, um, as the Crown Agent has observed, the, as it were, deep dive into that survey suggests that there are local, there are differences across the service. Uh, and that is something which the, um, the senior management of the service are 
um, actively uh, concerned to uh, explore and we, seek we, to that seek we're probably to address. covering older ground. I just wanted your reaction to, is that not something that worries you in the slightest? Are you quite satisfied that that wouldn't be the case? Uh, or uh, uh, is there a genuine concern there that should be looked at and acted upon? I, I think the right response is to do precisely what the service is doing, which is to analyse and identify where the specific problems are and to take active steps in order to address those problems. And that's precisely what the service uh, is doing. Um, and um, uh, uh, perhaps if I come back to my initial starting point, you know, I, think, I think we are under no doubt of the importance um, of an effective and fair prosecution service. It's what the service is there to provide, and um, uh, it is what the service will continue to provide in, 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 in the year ahead. And where there are um, local challenges to that, uh, the service has in, the service is taking action to, 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 to seek to address those. If I may, um, uh, convener, forgive me, since um, I, I last tried to address, if I found the relevant figure. Um, so I think that the relevant time we said it was 354 in relation to procurator's fiscal deputy and senior procurator's fiscal deputy, and that number is currently 349. So I was right, it's about five down okay, um, uh, in terms of the, the position. Um, and um, going back to, to the point in relation to what we are we are trying to do um, uh, is, you know, so by reference to the permanence, by reference to the stability, and also by reference to the, the vastly increasing proportion of the budget that we spend on staffing, it's precisely to try and address uh, uh, these points. Um, and um, so going back to, to, to the very basic point of if you look back over 10 or 11 years worth of statistics, two of those years we've had more than the current number of lawyers. Um, and as recently as July of 2015, we had under 500 lawyers. So since July of 15, so it's a relatively short period of time, we've actually, notwithstanding all of the constraints and notwithstanding the choices that we've had to make in relation to non-staffing and uh, uh, savings, etc., we have actually managed to increase the legal number since, since July of 15. So it's, 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 it's an indication of the intent and, 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 and the effort that's being made but fully appreciating per the evidence, and I don't quibble with any of it, the individual responses, that there is more work to be done. Okay, uh, that concludes our, our line of questioning. Can I thank you both for what's been a very um, worthwhile evidence session? And we now move on to agenda item number three, which is consideration of four public petitions, and I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. The committee is asked to consider and agree what action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to the, the petitions. Possible options are outlined in paragraph 5 of paper 3. Can I remind members, if they wish to keep a petition open, they should indicate how they would like the committee to take it forward, and if they wish to close a petition, they should give the reasons. If we consider each of the petitions in turn as they appear on in the paper. PE 1370, independent inquiry into the McGrackey conviction petition. The petition is discussed on pages two and three of the clerk's paper, and I invite comments from members. Liam MacArthur. Hey, thanks, Kavina. I think simply on the basis that um, previously we agreed to keep the petition open uh, on the basis that the uh, Operation Sand would um, uh, work had not yet been completed, and that still seems to be the case. It didn't seem to me any reason not to just keep the petition open for the time. Okay, that was certainly the case on 5th of September. Mary Fee, you concur? Is that the feeling of the committee? It is, right. Yes. Keep on open then, pending the completion of Operation Sandalwood. Moving on to, um, to petition... PE 1510 and PE 1511, Police and Fire Control Rooms. These petitions are discussed on page three of the clerk's paper. Um, perhaps I could have uh, some comments from members. As uh, paragraph 
13 of the clerk's paper during the committee's last considering, uh, consideration of these petitions at its meeting on the 5th of September. The committee agreed to keep the petition open to allow a response from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, to a letter from the petitioner to the, the petitioner of PE 1511. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the petitioner responded and um, you're invited to look at the correspondence and come to a view on whether the petitioner's concerns have been addressed. I can tell you that there's been no further communication received from the petitioner prior to this meeting. Any comments, Liam MacArthur? Um, certainly in relation to the, <clears throat> the first of those petitions, uh, convener, I think, um, to be fair to the Fire and Rescue Service, they've produced a, a fairly detailed response to which the petitioner has, has responded in, in kind. I think the substantive issues would appear to be um, uh, the, the reasons for a failure to respond to the, the FOI request that have been, uh, been put in. And uh, I think certainly pending that and, and perhaps any further response SFRS would wish to make um, on the back of the petitioner's uh, most recent response. I think it would be it worth certainly keeping that petition open for the time being. Um, I'm less certain about the other one on the basis that we but were not um, appraised to the petitioner's views. Um, okay. Um, any other views from members? Do you concur with that view? So that's to... Could you just clarify that you want to keep both open or close the first one, then keep the first one open, close? Could you clarify, please? Um, I, as I say, it, it seems to be less straightforward in relation to the second one because um, I, we're not clear on the, uh, any ongoing concerns that the petitioner has on the back of the, uh, the, the most recent responses we've, we, we've had. Um, so, as, as I say, I think I'm, I'm, I'm clear that in relation to 1510 that we should be keeping that open. Keep that open and please keep the 1511. is the Fire and Rescue Service. So that's right, sorry, that was that one. Sorry, I got the That's the one wrong. you yeah. want to keep open? Yeah. Yeah, and close um, 1510. Any other comments? Committee, um, happy to um, keep that open and close the other one. That's fine. We are all agreed to that. Can I move on to the third um, petition, PE 1633? private criminal prosecutions in Scotland. This is the committee's first time considering this petition. It calls for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law to give people of Scotland the same legal rights as the rest of the UK by removing the requirement that the Lord Advocate must first give permission before a private criminal prosecution can be commenced in Scotland. Possible options are outlined in paragraph five of paper three, and I, um, I invite comments from members. John Finney and Rona. Thank you, Commissioner. I read this with great interest and uh, a lack of awareness, I have to say, because it seems to me that the, the, the fundamental flaw perhaps isn't the one that the petitioner would identify. I, I, I think the Lord Advocate should be taking the lead in this regardless. But um, I'm also concerned that uh, RIDOR, or the reporting of uh, injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrence, which is a fundamental component part of workplace health and safety, uh, it's alluded to that doesn't uh, um, apply. And that would certainly inform decision making around whether there should or shouldn't be a prosecution. So I'd be keen that we maybe look further into this. Uh, I, I think there are a number of issues that are, are worthy of consideration. Okay, thank you. Rona McCann. Thank you, Convener. Yes, can I declare an interest in this? This uh, petition has been brought by a constituent of mine. Um, I think this is a, is a really, really interesting um, issue, one I hadn't really been aware of before. I think it's um, to do with access to justice as well. I think it could, could almost be looked as a loophole in, in the law at the moment where the health and safety executive appear to have autonomy over matters um, and in some cases would deny people um, access to justice. So I think it's one that we need to, we need to take fully on and um, you know, ask for submissions, contact the Law Society, Faculty of Advocates, and, and maybe take some oral evidence um, from the petitioner. Okay, any other views? Liam, yeah. 
just purely and simply, it, just what Rona Mackay's just said is exactly where I am on it. I think there's, there's merit in what Rona is suggesting. As a yes, I, I think there were some worrying um, aspects uh, raised of this, not least that um, it was noted that the Health and Safety Executive decides that it will not provide a report to the Crown Procurement on, on an accident at work, then there's nothing that can be done. Yeah. And also some of the barriers if um, the Lord Advocate was challenged if he decided not to have a prosecution. So one possibility, um, the committee, if it does want to get progress this matter would be to write to the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, which means when we return in, in January we'll have their submissions and on the back of that we could see if we want to, what we want to do thereafter. John yes, I, I wonder, Commissioner, would be a benefit in asking the STUC for their comments in relation yes. to this as well, please. Absolutely. So that's Law Society, Faculty of Advocates and the uh, STUC. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you for that. That completes consideration of our, um, our petitions and we now move into private session. The next committee meeting will be on the 9th of January 2018 when we'll consider the draft report on the Scottish Government's 2018-19 draft budget and a draft stage one report on the offensive behaviour at football repeal. Bill. So it only remains for me to wish everyone a very happy and um, Merry Christmas. Spend now to allow the public gallery to clear. I think that should be quite straightforward. Mm -hmm.